Well, children, how would you describe New Zealand using one word? Any word to describe New Zealand? There's no right or wrong. Nothing? Wow, we're really talkative today. Yep. Expensive. Yeah, fair. Fair. Uh, what else? I can wait all day. Yeah. Small. Yeah, because there's some countries that are huge, right? What about when it comes to our government? Do we have like a king or what do we have as a government in New Zealand? Just a normal government? Yeah, that, yeah, okay. We don't have a king or queen. That's right, we don't have an emperor. And is it the sort of country where you can um, sort of do what you want or do you get told what to do all the time, always? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. We get to do kind of what we want, right? The government says, look, you can live how you want, but just don't break these rules, okay? Generally speaking, no comments, parents. We, we have general freedom in our country. And look, there's lots of different countries and lots of different kingdoms and lots of different nations, and they're all quite different. And they're all trying to get better or get worse, do you think? That's right. They don't want to get like they don't want to have less money and less power and less land. They want to advance, don't they? They want to grow and become stronger and more powerful. Well, you know, we're talking about the kingdom of God today, and the kingdom of God is also growing and advancing and moving forward. It doesn't always look like it. Sometimes we look around ourselves and we go, hmm. The kingdom of God in the church seems to be getting smaller. And you look in one country and it's sort of going and shrinking. And you look in another country and it's going and growing. But the kingdom of God is always growing. Why is the kingdom of God always advancing and getting more powerful, do you think? Great answer. The more people that believe in Jesus, the bigger the kingdom gets. That's right. And there's always more people getting saved. What else do you think? Why else? Satan's king is getting smaller. Great answer. That's right. But there's another answer. Who's in control of the kingdom of God? Yes, great answer. That's right. God's in control of the kingdom. Now, can, is anyone bigger or stronger than God? No. So there's no one that can be like, look, I don't like God's kingdom, so I'm going to make up a kingdom which is going to waste God's kingdom, can they? Because God's God, and he's in control of everything, and he is moving his kingdom forward. And we're going to be looking at the kingdom of God at the time of David, and we're going to see a whole bunch of battles and a whole bunch of victories that are all sort of like smooshed together in one chapter. And we're going to learn some stuff about the kingdom. But the wonderful thing we can have is hope. Because we're on the winning side. And so we sang that song, who is on the Lord's side? We're on the Lord's side, which means we're on the winning side, which means we can have confidence. Let's pray and thank God for that. Father in heaven, we thank you for the kingdom of God, which is advancing forward, always moving, always growing, always being built. We thank you that Satan is too weak to do anything about it, and that one day it will be fully finished. And Christ will be king over all. And we thank you and help. We pray that you'd help us to trust him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 8. <clears throat> and we're going to be reading through the whole chapter this morning. This is God's holy and inerrant word for you this morning. <clears throat> After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Mepheg Amar out of the hand of the Philistines. And he defeated Moab, and he measured them with a line, making them lie down on the ground. Two lines he measured to be put to death, and one full line to be spared. 
And the Moabites became servants to David and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to restore his power at the river Euphrates. And David took from him 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. And David hamstrung all the chariot horses, but left enough for 100 chariots. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 men of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Aram of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought tribute. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went, and David took the shields of gold that were carried by the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Batar and from Berothai, cities of Hadadezer, King David took very much bronze. When Toy, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated the whole army of Hadadezer, Toy sent his son Joram to King David to ask about his wealth and to bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him, for Hadadezer had often been at war with Toy. And Joram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. These are also these also David dedicated to the Lord, together with the silver and gold that he dedicated from all the nations he subdued, from Edom, Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David made a name for himself when he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Then he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom, he put garrisons. And all the Edomites became David's servants. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel. And David administered justice and equity to his people. <clears throat> Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder, and Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were priests, and Sariah was secretary, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Kerithites and the Palathites, and David's sons were priests. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word to us, and let us come before him in a time of prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that, that it is both rich and true and and good for our souls. It's like a sweet balm, that it is water to the thirsty and food to the hungry and refreshing for our souls. It is purified seven times. And that wherever your word goes, it achieves what you send it to do. And that your word never goes out void and that your word never fades or disappears. Lord, we pray that you would make all of those truths come to pass this morning for us. We ask that your word would take root in our very soul, that we would be edified and built up. Lord, help us, for your word will have no spiritual good in our souls unless your Holy Spirit illuminates it to us. And so we ask that as I speak simple words of English to simple human listeners, that God, you would speak to each and every one of us. 
the glorious message of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, it's tempting when we come to chapters like this one to just sort of shrug our shoulders and go, oh, yep, another summary chapter in Samuel or Kings. You get quite a lot of them as you go through. Just You'll be following the story and you'll be getting into the story. And then all of a sudden, the author just sort of stops, breaks away from the story and says, oh, by the way, all this stuff happened. And you go, oh, okay, next. You, you know, if you think about chapter 7, this amazing chapter of the Davidic covenant between God and David and very personal and intimate. And then in chapter 9, which we'll look at tonight, you get this very intimate, incredible story of kindness of David to Mephibosheth. And sandwiched in between it is this sort of like collection of battles and massacres and all around pretty horrible stories, you know, like, I don't know what it looks like to lay down an entire nation of people and measure them out and kill two thirds of them. But it's pretty bizarre, right? You sort of read through, you're like, wow, really? It's in the Bible. Someone was saying to me recently, um, you know, the Bible's just filled with so many amazingly interesting stories. Children should never, ever be bored. You know, between the stabbing of fat people, it's just bizarre, some of the stuff in the Bible, isn't it? And we find ourselves in this chapter and we're scratching our head and going, what's this all about? Why does the author stop and give us this incredible chapter of David defeating five nations, five kings? It's not the battle of five armies from the Hobbit. It's the battle of five armies from Samuel. Well, it's actually really important what happens in this moment. There's an extremely important reason why all of a sudden, after chapter 7, the author has smashed into here all of this stuff in chapter 8 with almost none of the detail. And it has everything to do with the promises of chapter 7. Do you remember, it was a couple of weeks ago now, but a couple of weeks ago we looked at the promises of, that God had given to David. I think it was in the evening service. And we talked about the fact that God had promised that the combination of the promise to Adam and the promises and the Abrahamic covenant, and he had brought them both together and delivered them to David and said, I'm fulfilling my promises to them through you. It's through you that I'm going to bring these promises to fruition. And he talked about giving David a name and giving David a people and establishing them a rest and pushing back their enemies. And, and we saw that David responded in the end of the chapter with great gratitude and thanksgiving and praise to this God who promises. But then at the end of the chapter, you're left asking the question, how will this come about? How will the kingdom of God be established in David and through David and in God's people? And that's exactly what chapter 8 shows us, doesn't it? Chapter 8 is effectively the answer to the question, will God keep his promise to David? And so the, the author takes a selection of five fights, battles, moments in David's rule and brings them together in this chapter in order to highlight to the reader and to the people that God is a faithful, covenant-keeping, promise-keeping, word-fulfilling, faithful God. That when he promises, he never fails to deliver. That there will never be one word that God has not promised that he will not fulfill. And so it is true of the kingdom of God. And so as we come to this chapter, I simply want us to ask the question, what sort of kingdom is being established in fulfillment of chapter 7? So chapter 7 is the promise. Chapter 8 is the fulfillment of what sort of promised kingdom is being established under David? And firstly, we see that 
this kingdom that's being established is a victorious kingdom. It's a kingdom of victory. David goes out and the word that that crops up over and over and over again in the Hebrew is the word strike. And it gets translated in a variety of different words from defeat to destroy to strike. And it bounces back and forth. But in the Hebrew, it's just this word strike. And so in chapter 8, verse 1, we see David struck the Philistines and subdued them. Verse 2, he struck Moab and measured them. Verse 3, he struck Hadadezer, the king of Zobah. Verse 5, He struck down 22,000 men of the Syrians. And then in verse 13, he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites. Everywhere David turns, he wins, right? Everywhere he turns. Five nations, one after the other. And these are not insignificant little nations. These are large nations, powerful kingdoms. These are major kingdoms of his time, kingdoms that have oppressed the people of God for generations. And all of a sudden, in a sort of swash over quick little story in chapter 8, we get David victoriously conquering every opposing kingdom to the kingdom of God. And the victory is not just a little victory, is it? The author goes to painstaking, small, quick details to highlight that the victory that comes is total victory. It's not like, oh, we just beat the Philistines, right? So in chapter 8, verse 1, it tells us that David defeats the Philistines and subdues them and takes Mephegamah. You're like, well, what's Mephegamah? Mephegamah is their capital which means they've struck right into the heart of the Philistine encampment and taken from them their most important city. And then in verse 2, we see this weird incident with Moab and the measuring of the men upon the ground. And so he, he conquers them and he has such control over the Moabite army that he lies them all down. And he goes through and he kills two thirds of them. What is it? It's a, it's a display of the ultimate power and control of King David over the Moabites, right? And then we see in verse 3 that when, when David comes against Hadadezer, he, he takes from him 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. He strikes down 22,000 Syrians. It's a, it's a slaughter. It's an absolute destruction by David. And he takes these horses and he hamstrings them, removing one of the key military weapons of that time from the people surrounding Israel. And then in Edom, they go up and destroy 18,000. And what you hear echoed time and time again is what? And they became servants. They became vessels. They became slaves to the people of Israel. Time and time again, through God's chosen representative, the nations are brought to their knees around David. And brothers and sisters, this is the story of the kingdom of God. It has not changed. Yes, the kingdom looks different now than it used to. Under David, it was one kingdom, under one nation, under a political nation. Whereas now, the kingdom of God is vast, right? It covers all the nations, every people, every kingdom, under every inch of the world. The kingdom of God is advancing. And what happens when the kingdom of God advances? The exact same thing. Nations are brought to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. You see, the kingdom of God will have no contenders. 
We may not see it today. We, we may struggle to see it. But the kingdom of God is a victorious kingdom, brothers and sisters. You can have confidence. And you know what? I don't care which dictator tells you that the church will lose. They're wrong. Every dictator that has sought to destroy the church of Christ has been shown to be wrong. You think about China, what happened? They removed the missionaries. They crushed the church. They did everything they could to strip it down and destroy it. And when the, when the bamboo curtain was raised and missionaries went back in, what did they find? Churches flourishing everywhere underneath the oppression of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of God flourished. And it happens everywhere because the kingdom of God can never be overcome. I know it doesn't look like it all the time. But do you realize that the current agendas of this world, they can never stop the church of Christ? You need not worry. You need not fear. You can have courage and you can do what David did. See, what did David do? He didn't just sit and wait for God to deliver the kingdom, did he? He had a specific role to do as God's representative and he led the kingdom of God forward. He took up sword, he strategized, he did all that was required of him. Now, we're not David. But each and every one of us have a role to play in the kingdom of God, don't we? It might be really, really small and insignificant in the world's eyes. Or it might be really, really big. It might be laboring in your workplace as a believer. It might be striving to get into politics. It might be just praying every single morning for the advance of the kingdom of God. But we all have a role to play. Every one of us, no one's excluded. Every citizen of the kingdom of God has a job to do. So brothers and sisters, let us, metaphorically speaking, take up our swords and fight for the kingdom of God, right? For we have been given spiritual armor, we have been given swords and shields and helmets and breastplates with which to fight the schemes of the devil. That we battle against principalities. But let us battle nonetheless. However, however, as we go to battle, a, a winning battle, a victorious battle, we recognize something else in this chapter, and that is that the kingdom of God is a dependent kingdom. It is a kingdom of dependency. You know, there's, there's two stunning verses that kind of just leap off this chapter. You know, David does this, David does that, David does this, David does that. And then in verse 6 and 14, we get the same exact words stated. Have a look at the end of verse 6. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. And then at the end of verse 14, in case we didn't get it the first time, the author writes, and the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. David did everything he could, right? He would have drawn up his battle lines. He would have made plans. He would have done everything in his ability and strength. But at the end of the day, it was not David that brought the victory, was it? But it was the Lord. And so too for us. Yes, we have a, a role to play. But we must recognize that, that we, in and of ourselves, we cannot build the kingdom. We cannot advance the kingdom. We cannot win the victory. We cannot save souls. We cannot see people brought into the kingdom. We are utterly dependent upon God upon our Father, upon the Lord Jesus Christ, upon the Spirit of the living God. I mean, just think about the act of salvation, right? Please put your hand up 
if you were the one that saved yourself. You know, one day you were sitting there in your home and you were an unbeliever and you hated God. And one day you said, actually, I know I hate God, but I've decided I'm going to start loving God. None of us did that, right? It was while we were enemies that Christ died for us. It was while we were enemies that the Spirit of God regenerated our hearts and made us want to be saved. And that's just a tiny picture of the reality of the kingdom. You see, the only way that the church of Christ is going to penetrate Manurewa is if the Spirit of God descends upon Manurewa. Through his people, yes. But unless God acts into this town, into your workplace, into your family, wherever it is that, that you are looking at the kingdom of darkness and wherever you're thinking, oh God, how I want the kingdom of God there. The only way it's going to happen is if God does it. Yes, he uses weapons. Yes, he uses vessels. But it's God who does it. And so we fall down before him and say, oh Lord, save my child. Be merciful upon my parent. Save my husband. Save my wife. Save my work colleague. Bring your kingdom to come. Isn't it striking that we pray that? May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Well, because Jesus had read this book of Samuel, right? He knew the Old Testament probably off by heart. And so when his disciples said, teach us to pray, he said, pray that the kingdom would come because it's not going to come unless God does it. And so too for us. You know, we're planning on having a carol service outside and inviting the neighborhood. What's going to bring them in? Well, it's not us. And let's be honest. We're all pretty average. I mean, some of you are pretty amazing, but most of us are pretty average. We haven't got that much going for us, right? We don't have a billion-dollar church and a billion-dollar sound system and all the bells. Or what if we, we've got the Lord, right? We've got God. God, you need to bring them in. We'll drop the flyers. We'll invite them. We'll tell them to come. But the only way they're getting off their couch on Christmas carol service day is if God stirs their heart. And so let us pray that God would advance his kingdom. And so the kingdom of God is a victorious kingdom, and it's, it's a dependent kingdom, but it's also a worshipful kingdom. Did you notice what David did with the victory spoils? Did you see that in, in verse 11 and 12? Verse 11 and 12, these also, speaking of all of the silver, all of the gold, all of the bronze that got given to him from toy, toys, toys. These also King David dedicated to the Lord together with the silver and the gold that he dedicated with all the nations he subdued from Edom, Moab, Ammonites, Philistines, Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. What's David do with the victory? As the kingdom of God advances, what does David do? Does he take the spoil back to Jerusalem and stick it in his house and sit on his lovely pile of gold and silver and bronze and stroke his beard and talk about how amazing he is? Does he strut around like a peacock? No. He brings it all to God, doesn't he? He gives it all to the Lord. He says, the Lord... The victory is yours. I can't boast. I can't take credit. There's no honor for David, but all honor for you. All glory to God. And that's the gospel message of the kingdom. It's not about you and me, right? If God so chooses to mercifully visit Manurewa and build this church and drag the nations in and to build the church down the road and the church down the road and the church down the road and we see them established and built up and, and this place, the crime disappears. 
You don't even need to lock your car when you park in Manurewa on the side of the road. What a miracle that would be. Imagine if that took place. Who of us, who of us would have the right to say, oh, it was me. It was me. It was my clever planning. It was our amazing musicians. It was our fantastic pastors. It was our special baking. None of us could say that, could we? No, we bring it all back to God. We bring it all back to the throne and lay it down at the feet of God and say, God, all glory, Lord, and honor to you, my great king. You remember that picture at the end of Revelation? Revelation 4 and 5 with the elders gathered around the throne. Do you remember what they do? They've got crowns and they cast them down before God. They deserved those crowns. They earned those crowns. But at the end of the day, they willingly laid them down before the king. And so too for us, right? There was a man called Thomas Chalmers. He was a lecturer at Edinburgh College, the university there. And... And he was like the one, the one guy who was not liberal in the entire college. And, and he raised up, in the Scottish Presbyterian Church, he raised up a generation of missionaries after him. Learned, incredible missionaries. Men like Henry Martin. And, and he said to his students, what I want you to do is to labor with every ounce of your being to build the biggest crown for yourself that you can build in this world. And when you read that, you think to yourself, wow, this guy's really arrogant. So so you just build this enormous crown on your head so that you can lay it down at the feet of Jesus Christ. Don't think that Christianity means we don't pursue excellence. That humility means we don't pursue scholarship and promotion. Oh, we pursue all those things with all of our might. But we do it so that we can lay it at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, God and King, here is my simple offering for you. So what sort of offering are we going to bring him? Well, it's going to depend on how we live our life, right? I'm reminded of the story that John Piper tells of the, of the couple who retired and, and bought a lovely yacht and lived, retired early and lived on the seaside, so seaside collecting seashells. And, and Piper imagines them standing before the king one day, standing before God one day and saying, look, God. Look at my shell collection. Isn't it pathetic? Look at my shell collection. What are we going to present to him? Shells? Or service in the kingdom of God? Well, we have a kingdom of victory and dependence and worship and then Lastly, we have a kingdom of justice and equity. Have a look at verse 15. Uh, David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and equity to all his people. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat was the recorder. Zadok was um, Zadok, the son of Ahitab, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were priests. And Sariah was secretary, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Kerithites and the Palathites, and David's sons were priests. And now we read that section and we go, interesting, right? Like when we're doing our Bible's time, we read through it and go, okay, there's a bunch of dudes that do a bunch of stuff. That's because we don't live in that world, right? The, the, the original readers, they would have read this and gone, oh, that guy did that job. Wow, that's pretty cool. And that guy did that job. Oh, wow, amazing. But, you know, all of the lists of the guys, you can just say, this is David ordering his kingdom well. 
under God. But aren't those two words beautiful? That David reigned and administered justice and equity. Don't we long for justice, brothers and sisters? I mean, you don't have to look far in this world to find injustices, right? You know, I've told you about the time I was falsely accused. What I don't think I've ever mentioned is what happened afterwards. I've told you that I was vindicated. But afterwards, my regional manager, though I was declared innocent, wrote, wrote me a written warning. Why? For creating a work culture which enabled people to falsely accuse me of things. Why? Because then my employer didn't have to pay for my legal fees. Where's the justice? And the, and the lawyer said to me, we could fight this if you want, but it's going to cost a lot of money. And what do you do? You're just one little person with no power, with no money. You're like the little widow, right? Going to the wicked judge, pleading for justice. But what does Jesus say? God is nothing like that judge. God gives justice to his children. And the kingdom of God is a just kingdom. And there are two wonderful, practical, glorious truths that flow out from that. Firstly, one day you will receive justice. It may not be in this life. In fact, it probably won't be in this life. Consider all of the Christians who are being massacred in Nigeria. How many of them are seeing justice today? None of them. And yet, one day, they will stand before God and he will vindicate their name. You know, this past week, someone contacted me and said to me, they were thinking about being married to a person who's not a savory character. Let's just put it that way. And they said to me, I'm so thankful that one day I will stand before God and God will tell him, God will tell him that what I spoke was true. That the word of God that I shared was true. Do you know that? Do you know that there's a day of justice coming? Do you know what that enables you to do as a believer? It enables you to get walked on. Now, I'm not suggesting you have to lay down and get walked on all the time. But when you find yourself in powerless situations, you can accept it and entrust it to the judge of heaven who always judges rightly. So that's the first truth. The second truth is that if the kingdom of God is a kingdom of justice, what ought the people of God to be? A people of justice, right? This is why we're instructed to love. This is why we're instructed not to show partiality, James 2, right? This is why we're called to welcome all. This is why we don't exclude the rich and welcome the poor or exclude the poor and welcome the rich. This is why there's no room for racism. This is why there's no room for sexism. This is why there's no room for any ism. Because we welcome and love with justice and equity. And so our leaders seek to lead with equity and justice. And so the church of Christ is to be a place of justice. And what a travesty when it's not. We destroy the credit of God and his kingdom when there is injustice in the kingdom of God. I mean, just think, just think about how many people say to you comments like, but the church promoted slavery. Don't people love to remind you of that? And the horrible thing is it did. When William Wilberforce stood up and said, slavery is an abomination, the church said, yeah, but, but black people 
They're not like full humans. I'm not making this up. We don't even know if they've got souls. So we're not really mistreating them. What a travesty. The injustice done in the name of Christ. And churches today which celebrate abortion. Oh, may it not be so. May the people of God be just. You know, the church of Christ ought to be the one place where an orphan or a widow or a sojourner may walk in and find justice, peace, equity. And it starts here, right? It's not just our elders. It starts here, right? In the way we treat one another. When we welcome a a person that walks in the door who looks a bit like us and acts like us and has the same humor as us and we welcome them in and we love them and then someone walks in the door who smells funky and he's been living on the street and when we just sort of turn away and we welcome one person and exclude another, it starts in our hearts, right? As the kingdom of God works itself out in us and in our families and in the church. And this is what we see in David, this glorious kingdom working out. And yet we realize for David, it didn't work out, did it? Well, it did for David, but it didn't for his children. Well, you got two generations, his grandson, the kingdom breaks up into two. A few hundred years after that, the northern kingdoms are packed off to exile. A few generations after that, Jerusalem's packed off to Babylon. Justice wasn't done in Israel. Victory wasn't maintained in Israel. Dependency was not held on to in Israel. Worship was not fulfilled in Israel. And that's because as tempting as it is to look at chapter 7 and 8 and say, we've made it, we've arrived, this isn't it, is it? Because we've got to get to Daniel 2 and see the statue with the rolling boulder smashing it to pieces and establishing the kingdom of God at the coming of Christ. And we've got to see Christ come and Christ has to come and say, I will build my church in enemy occupied territory and it will never be overthrown. And I'm going to build it. And like a tree, it's going to grow up and fill the earth. And all the nations are going to come and rest in it. And it's going to be glorious. My kingdom, a forever kingdom. And that's exactly the picture we get when we get to the end of the Bible. Isn't it? Revelation 20. Turn with me. It's just such a stunning picture. Revelation chapter 20. We see, we see this kingdom. Now, we're not going to comment on the thousand years. You can ask me my view on that later if you want. Chapter 20. Have a look at verse 7. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. Now, just, just picture this, right? Satan will be released from his prison and will come to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, to to gather them for battle. Can you see it? Their number is like the sand of the sea. Can Can you picture it? Like the sand of the sea. Like every human on the face of the earth that is an unbeliever gathered together with every king, every ruler, every prince. They're all gathered there with their nuclear weapons and their machine guns and their tanks and their power and their money and everything that they have. And you're you're getting set up for a a war to remember, right? And, And they marched up. You can imagine them proudly with their banners flapping in the breeze. They marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. Oh, here's this. it's not even a city. It's not even a kingdom. It's just this little camp in the midst of this enormous host of enemies. There's this little camp of the saints and the beloved city. And what happens? But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire 
and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Do you get the point? So this, it's a raining, they're coming, they're coming, and poof, they're gone. This is the path we're on, brothers and sisters. Though kingdoms rage, for God it's finished. And so the victory is secure in Christ. Oh, one day he will come, brothers and sisters. And regardless of your view on the millennium, one day he will come. And all things will be made right. And justice will be restored. And we will dwell in peace with him forever. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this hope that we have in the glorious King. We pray, Lord, fill us with hope. Fill us with a zeal for the kingdom of God, a zeal for Christ, to labor with all our might, and to see God's kingdom grow and grow and grow. We thank you for those words that we heard out of the mouths of babes this morning. That the kingdom of God always grows because people get saved. And because Satan's kingdom always shrinks. Help us to believe it. Help us to act upon it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.